Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he addressed them this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in just the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way I tell you, there will be more rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of the, your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off for a distant country, where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat the fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here I am, dying of hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat me, treat one of your hired hands. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it and let us celebrate with a feast. Because the son of mine was dead and has come back to life again. He was lost and has been found. And the celebration began. Now the older son who had been out in the field was at, had been out in the field and on his way back as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became, he became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, and yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, you swallowed up your property with prostitutes. For him, you slaughter the fatted calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. parable of the prodigal son. It is one of Jesus' defining parables, though many people misinterpret it. The parable demonstrates for us how sin works and how grace works. First of all, the parable is misnamed. It should have never been named the parable of the prodigal son because the story isn't really about him. The parable should be named the parable of the generous father. Okay, so the younger son goes to his father and asks for his share of the inheritance in advance. Talk about arrogance. It's not his yet. It still belongs to his father. That's like wishing your father dead so you can get his stuff. That's the first effect of sin. Sin makes us exaggerate our own self-importance. Sin makes us egocentric. 
Sin makes us think we deserve what we don't really deserve. And the father, in extraordinary generosity, does what his son requests. He divides the property and gives it to his son. His son then sells the property and moves away. That's the second effect of sin. Sin takes us far away from God. Sin distances us from our true family, the church. Then the boy squanders his money on a life of wine, women, and song. That's the third effect of sin. If we leave the sin we're addicted to unaddressed, it breeds more sins. Famine strikes the land, the boy goes bankrupt. Fourth, attempt, fourth effect of sin. Sin satisfies us for a while, but it ultimately ends, us, ends up leaving us empty, alone, and unsatisfied. And finally, the boy finds himself starving and taking care of pigs. That is the ultimate lower than low for a Jew who would have nothing to do with pigs. When Jesus told this part of the story, I can only imagine every scribe and Pharisee who was listening to this cringed because that's like the bottom as you can go. And he's so hungry, this boy is willing to eat the pig slop. That's the last effect of sin. We sacrifice our dignity until our behavior can't even be distinguished from the animals. Now, fortunately, we also see in this parable the pattern of God's grace at work. Coming to his senses at last. That's the first effect of grace. Grace slaps us on the back of the head and says, what the heck are you doing? Look at you. Go back where you belong. God calls us to repent. Then the son works out a little speech to give to his dad when he gets back. Father, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you want one of your hired servants. Second effect of grace. We respond to God and offer repentance and contrition. We become keenly aware of our sins and we experience sorrow over them. The son goes home. Dad sees him at a distance and runs down to him. That's a great detail. Because that's beneath the father's dignity. In the Semitic world, parents do not rush to their children. Children rush to their parents. It is beneath the father's dignity to run down to his son. But again, this is the parable of the generous father. Unlike the son who squanders his dignity on sin, the generous father willingly sacrifices his dignity in love. The father embraces his son and doesn't even give him time to finish expressing his repentance. That's how eager God is to forgive us. Instead, he orders a robe, sandals, and a ring to be brought out to his son. All of these things are signs of dignity. The father restores the boy's status as a son. When we go to confession and we get our sins cleansed, our status as children of God is restored. Then the father orders the fatted calf killed in a celebration feast. You didn't kill the fatted calf for the usual Sunday dinner with the family. You killed the fatted calf for a wedding or a visiting dignitary, something of that status. Once again, generous father. Now, Jesus could have ended the parable right there, but instead he throws in this element of the older brother. The older brother is working in the fields when he hears the music and the dancing. A servant tells him that his brother has returned, and the elder son gets so angry he won't go in the house. So the father has to come out and plead with him. Again, generous father. In the Semitic world, fathers do not plead with their children. Fathers order their children, and their children had better obey if they know what's good for them. Now, why does Jesus add this element of the older brother? Jesus is presenting us with an interesting question. Which of these two sons is the bigger sinner? And the answer may surprise you. The elder son. The elder son is the bigger sinner. He's, he's often referred to as the good son, but again, that's because people misunderstand the parable. The elder son displays the exact same pattern of sin that his younger brother does. The difference is, the younger son is guilty of corporal sins, sins of the flesh. The elder son is guilty of spiritual sins, jealousy and unforgiveness. 
The younger son repented of his sins, but the elder brother does not. How does the parable end? The younger son feasting in the house on the fatted calf, where's the elder son brooding in his anger alone out in the fields? Who is Jesus addressing this parable to? The Pharisees and the scribes who were complaining that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was saying to them, you guys are the elder son. Both sons hurt their father. The younger son fell into sins of the flesh because of his youth and ignorance, but he repented. You guys, on the other hand, know better. But you're committing sins of unforgiveness and you're not repenting. That's why the tax collectors and sinners will get to heaven and you won't. My brothers and sisters, the point of this parable is that our relationship with God hinges on how well we repent of the sins we've committed and how well we forgive other people for the sins they've committed. Take that to heart. And blessed be God forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.